As a designer, that really helps me know what the heck to design. You know, like I can create cool things all day long, but if it's not actually reflecting what it needs to reflect, then I'm not doing a good job. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. You know the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, right? Well, it's an important rule to live by. And yet, how many times have you found yourself scrolling through book recommendations or standing at the airport bookstore or perusing a friend's bookshelf looking for the book cover that strikes you as the perfect next read? Now, if I'm being honest, a book's cover is the first thing that captures my attention and pulls me to read the jacket to learn more about the story inside. Knowing the impact a book cover can have on a potential reader, I wanted to find a designer who could capture the feeling and the message of my first book, all while translating a personal brand that I built for the last decade plus to a new medium. And that designer turned out to be Iowa native Brianna Summers. Brianna is the founding designer behind Brighton Made. She's on the podcast with me to talk about designing the cover of How Are You Really, as well as her corporate to entrepreneur pivot and the advice she has for other dreaming designers about striking out on their own and landing their dream clients. I'm so excited to reveal the creative process behind my book, How Are You Really? And of course, if you haven't picked up your copy yet, now is a great time to buy one. Now let's get into it with Brianna Summers. If you love listening to the Gold Digger podcast, you'll love the full lineup of business and entrepreneurial focused podcasts on the HubSpot Podcast Network, like Marketing Made Simple, hosted by Dr. JJ Peterson. Marketing Made Simple brings you practical tips to make your marketing easy and more importantly, make it work. He's got a robust catalog of ready to binge episodes like why your videos aren't engaging customers, an amazing no cost strategy to get more leads and how to build your social media content calendar. Listening to marketing made simple wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to Zapier for supporting the Gold Digger podcast. Zapier makes it easy for anyone to get started with business automation, no coding required. See for yourself why teams at Airtable, Dropbox, HubSpot, Zendesk, and thousands of other companies use Zapier every day to automate their businesses. Try Zapier for free today at zapier.com slash gold digger. Okay, Miss Brianna, it is about time. I feel like we have been talking about having you on the show for months because we've gotten to work together for months. So welcome to the Gold Digger podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is like such a dream as someone who listens to this podcast and like grew my business by listening to this podcast. This is just like a pinch me moment. So oh, thank you I'm for so having excited. me. <laughs> Isn't that wild? It's so cool. I've, I've really lately been leaning on like trust in the timing of your life. And I've been working with so many incredible entrepreneurs through the book process and different things. And it's just like, so kismet in the sense of like, when we work together, it was so meant to be the timing was so divine. And I feel that way with you. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It's just crazy how life works. Okay. So before we dive in and talk about kind of our process that we got to work through together in designing, how are you really cover? I want to know more about how you got started in your design business. Like, were you always someone who thought you'd be an entrepreneur? Tell me kind of the backstory about Brighton Made. Yeah. So I kind of always knew that I wanted to be my own boss, but I always figured it would be, you know, years down the road after working in the corporate world for many years, you know, maybe after I had kids and kind of wanted to just do my own thing and be a freelancer. But yeah, my entrepreneurial journey is not linear. So I, right after college, I got a job at Better Homes and Gardens Magazine, which I thought was my dream job just because like I had job shadowed there when I was 12 years old. It's local to where I'm at, which is in Des Moines. And it's kind of unheard of to have like a publisher, like being in the Midwest. Um, Normally you have to like move out to New York city. And so I thought like all the stars had aligned 
And shortly after working there, I realized that it just like was not what I thought it was. <laughs> and I was like, I went to school to be creative and I feel like I'm doing everything but being creative. Yeah. And so I, while I was there, long story short, had, you know, started a side hustle with a friend, a different company than what I'm doing now. And then, you know, kind of like shortly after that, I was like, okay, well, I really want to quit my job, but this like business is not going to support the both of us. We were both at different stages of our lives. And so then I eventually started Bright and Made and quit my job like six months after starting that. But I mean, it was probably two and a half years of working that corporate job and trying to figure out something that would be sustainable to support me long-term. Oh my gosh. That is wild when you think about that journey. And I feel like for so many of us, we land what we think is the dream job. And then we get there and we're like, this isn't what I thought it would be. Or like, this isn't how I thought it would feel. And I just think that's a really big trend for entrepreneurs where it's like you're in pursuit of this linear path and then you kind of veer left or right. <laughs> and that's where we find ourselves. Did you feel any sort of pressure to stay like in that job and stick it out because it was the safe thing? Because I know like for a lot of us, especially in the Midwest, it's like those roots go deep. Yes, a hundred percent. It's so funny. I give my parents crap because they were really pushing me to stay at that corporate job. And even my boyfriend at the time, now husband was like, are you sure? Like, yeah. are you going to be okay? And I was just like, guys, listen, like if there's any time in my life that I'm going to do this, like it's going to be now. And you know what? I can always go get another job. Like if it doesn't work out, but I am going to do everything in my power to make sure that it does work. And yeah, it was just awesome because like, I think it was like in April of that year, I had already matched my corporate salary. And so wow. I just like, was like to them, I was like, see, like, this is what happens when you just like, let me, you know, trust in the process. And so, yes. yeah, it's definitely scary and something that, you know, you feel like you're like diving head first, but it's so, so worth it. And yeah, no, I, I couldn't be happier that I just like went with my gut. I want to know, like, what were those early days like for you? For me, it was like, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was working so hard. And I feel like you just touched on it where it's like, when you bet on yourself for the first time in such a massive way, you will do anything in your power to prove that you made a good bet. <laughs> yes. so, what were those <laughs> early days like for you? Yeah. So I, gosh, I like worked 24 seven. I still kind of do, but I like literally would, you know, go in the office, you know, take a lunch break, go do some design, you know, in the cafeteria. And then, you know, even sometimes like try to like schedule a client call if I needed to during that time and then go finish up my work day. And then right after work would literally like plop my laptop on the couch and hang out with my boyfriend at the time and just like design away until, you know, it was bedtime and then woke up and did the whole thing again. And so it was exhausting. It was a lot but I knew that I had to put in that time in order to get to where I wanted to be. And so, yeah, it was, it was wild. And then like, after I left my corporate job, I was like, okay, so this is weird. Like, I'm not like, I had those funds of like, you're being paid, you know, for these hours, like no matter what, every single day. But then when I left, it was like, I was kind of thrown for a loop. because I was like, how do I manage my time now? Like time is money. And it's not like, I'm just, you know, making money either way. Like, no, yes. my time is so much more valuable. And so that was when I kind of had decided to step away from the other side hustle that I had created because I was like, my time is so much more important now that I'm not like having that steady paycheck. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was just like very eye opening and definitely a transition. And it took me a lot of time to just get comfortable with working from home. You know, I think that was one of the biggest things that I struggled with was I just felt so lonely. You know, I was working from mm -hmm. home before it became like, quote unquote, trendy after the pandemic. And so, yeah, it was just, it was a hard transition, but I'm glad that I like kept pushing through because, you know, it got me to where I am now. I couldn't agree more with everything you said. And I like, you just brought me back to my days of like, literally pausing long enough to like eat some food and then getting back to work. And, you know, there's, there's this huge movement going on. I think it's beautiful because it's very anti-hustle culture. And I agree with that in so many aspects. I think that a lot of that messaging is really, really, you know, destructive for people. But at the same point, I also know that like there is hustle required to get a dream off the ground. Like there mm -hmm. is this level of sprinting required to gain momentum that will sustain you. 
And I think the problem that happens is when hustling becomes the go-to, when it becomes the norm, when it becomes just like, here's what we do every single day. And there is no end in sight. There's no finish line. There's no enough point. Did you hit burnout or like, have you pivoted or are you still in those days? Like, (laughs) what does that look like for you? Yeah. So honestly, like I just, as an Enneagram three and achiever, like I love to work hard. So that is just like ingrained in me and something that I will always, you know, I think will always be a part of me, but I have definitely like, you know, taken a step back from the hours I was putting in, you know, in those very, very early days. And now, I mean, I work when I want to work. So like, I love my job so much. So like for me, if I want to pull up my laptop on a Sunday evening to, you know, get caught up on, you know, the week ahead, like then I'll do it. I just kind of like go with what feels right to me. Like I never force myself to sit down and work. It's more so just like, I love design so much and I'm so passionate about it that it doesn't feel like work to me. But at the same time, I mean, I definitely have had, you know, seasons of burnout because I think you can only go on full steam, like for so long until you Mm -hmm. do hit that breaking point. And so I've definitely had to like train myself to like, it's okay to rest. Like it's okay to take the vacation. Yeah. I've like work will be there when you come back. So I definitely have to have those conversations with myself, but at the same time too, I'm like, it's okay. If you want to work, like if you like want to sit down and do the thing, like then do it. But just like having those check-ins with myself and making sure that like, it still feels in alignment and I'm not feeling drained, but rather like the work is bringing me a lot of energy and I'm excited about it and all of that. Oh my gosh. That's a perfect segue to talk about how are you really <laughs> and the project we got to work on. So here's what's crazy. And backstory for our listeners is I actually reached out to Brianna, like, what was it two years ago about a branding project? Because I've invested in a few different companies and my designer, Jen Olmstead had referred me to Brianna as an incredible creator. And so I had reached out to her and the timing and the project just wasn't right. But it's such a beautiful reminder again, of like trusting in the timing of your mm-hmm. life and trusting in the timing of your work. And we ended up circling back when it came time to design the book cover. And you were the only person I reached out to. I don't know if you know that. I did not know that. Yes, no. <laughs> I, you were you were it. You were it. And I knew it from the very beginning. So talk to me about what it was like to work on this project. I mean, yeah. let's just walk through it together. Yeah, no, it was all so, so crazy. Like when Jen referred you to me, I was just like so excited and so, so grateful for her. I love her so much. But when it came to the book, I was like, this is just like such a full circle moment for me because, you know, I had spent years working in the publishing world and working for a magazine. And so I had that editorial background, but I was like, I don't know how I'll ever like bring that back again. Cause you know, as a small business owner, usually lots of publishing companies, you know, they have their set designers and freelancers and all of that. And so you really have to like be in the know in order to do any of that type of work. So it was just crazy when that happened because you were like, would you be in like, I know you don't design book covers, but like, would you be interested? And I'm like, heck yes. Like this is such a cool moment. And I think, yeah, I don't know. Like there's just so much about designing a book that I feel like translates to a lot of the work that I do within branding. And that was like a really cool thing to just experience and be a part of and going through like all of the different iterations and just like, it's a lot like, you know, designing a logo, but it's yes. like, you know, the brand for your book, I guess. And it's crazy. Cause it's like, at this point, we've seen the book everywhere. So is it weird? Do you still feel like butterflies when you see your work in a target or Barnes and Noble or anywhere? I mean, it's just, I feel that way. So I'm like, yes. I hope everyone that's involved <laughs> feels that way too. <laughs> No, I totally do. It is such like a pinch me moment. And I even remember like, gosh, when I very first started my design career, I was like, I want to someday have something that is in target. Like that is a goal of mine. And so to like have that again, pan out just like with you and the book, it's just like, it's such a crazy feeling and it's so surreal. And one of those moments where you're like, I need to soak all of this in because like, this is like a milestone for sure. Yes. And it's so easy for us to just like skim over them or pass them by. It's like, no, 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 this is it. Like we're in it right now. It's just bananas. So let's talk about the design process and kind of walk people through it. Because 
for a lot of listeners, they've probably never hired a designer or worked with one. Mm -hmm. So where does the design process begin? And maybe we can just use our project as an example, but understand that it translates to any different medium of design. Yes. So for design, like for me, I have to feel like I really understand what I'm designing for. So when we first connected, I was like, I want to read, you know, part of the book or just like have a good understanding of like what you're after, because as a designer, that really helps me know what the heck to design, you know, like I can create cool things all day long, but if it's not actually like reflecting what it needs to reflect, then I'm not doing a good job. And so I definitely wanted to like have a good understanding of like the vision that you were after, as well as like what the mission of the book was. And so that was kind of one of the first big things is really trying to land on an overall creative direction. Cause I think when it comes to anything creative, like it can just feel so overwhelming when there are endless mm-hmm. and yes. endless possibilities. Like you're yes. like, what, what way do we go? Like, it's so hard. And so I have found it really works best to try to narrow in our vision first before trying to just like design anything and everything that comes to mind. Cause then you're just kind of like throwing darts, like blinded. Right. So it really helps to narrow in the process. So we kind of started with those two different concepts that we wanted to create. And so with that, we had two different mood boards with different color palettes, with just different directions the book could go. And the beautiful thing was, was that they kind of almost like ended up merging Mm -hmm. together in the end, which was really cool to see, but yeah, just kind of like taking it from there. And then I presented the two different concepts. So again, the two different design directions, and then, yeah, we slowly kind of merged them together until, you know, we just worked back and forth until it felt perfect, but I'll never forget. Like, so I was playing around and this is like such a designer thing, but I was struggling to fill the space because how are you are obviously all short words and then really is a longer word. And so I was like, there's this like dead space and I want to fill it with something, but I want it to be purposeful. And so when I sent it to you, I was like, I don't know if you're going to think this is stupid to have like an upside down question mark, but like the circle of that question mark fits in so nicely. And you're like, oh my gosh, no, I'm so glad you showed me that. And so It was Isn't just it crazy. Funny. It's funny too. So, like being on the receiving end, because I love design and I feel like I at least have a decent eye for design. I can't create in that way, but I can see things. And it was so fun. Like I it felt like Christmas morning every time like <laughs> new proofs would come in, just because it's like, oh my gosh, we're one step closer. And part of the design process is that like initial, like ground breaking, you know, stage where you're like, okay, are we going to get there? Are we going to get there? How are Mm -hmm. we going to get there? And it was so cool because it was like with each round, it got better and better and closer and closer. And same thing with the book itself. It was like, you don't just hand in one manuscript and it's done. You go back and forth for rounds of edits. And so it was such a beautiful, like collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could give our listeners any tips and you can literally say, if I did anything wrong too, I take zero (laughs) offense of being like the recipient and the guide, because at the end of the day, it's such a collaborative experience and it it can either be so positive or it can be really life-sucking. Yes, totally. So I definitely think making the process as collaborative as possible. Like I need your input just as much as you need my like guidance and expertise. Right. So making sure that I think, you know, both voices are heard and it's not just like, Oh, here, go and do this. This is exactly what I have in my head, but rather like, what do you think of this? And that was something that you were really awesome about was you would ask me like, what are your thoughts on like exploring something like this? And so I thought that was really cool because it just allowed me to feel empowered as the creator. Like, I don't think anyone really likes to be told exactly what to do. So (laughs) just like kind of leaning it back on them and making sure that like, it's an open communication as far as that goes. And then I, I think also too, as far as like feedback and everything, one thing that I know that I even told you, I was like, be careful about who you show this to, because I think when it comes to anything creative, you know, everyone's got an opinion. It's like baby names, right? Like you don't want to share the baby name with everyone, or maybe you do, (laughs) but someone's got an opinion and it might not be the opinion that you need to hear. And, you know, there's only, you know, few people that I feel like really like know your book best and know you best. And so those are the people that you can totally ask. But beyond that, I'm like, just try to keep it really close to you because I think, Otherwise, when you start to involve all different types of parties, you're going to get all different types of opinions. And then it's not going to end up being what you want it to be. And you're always going to be like, well, so-and-so said that they don't like this, but like, I knew that this is what I wanted. And so 
then you just like, yeah, you second guess yourself and all of that. And so I think it really helps to try to in design, like just like being very mindful of who you are getting feedback from. And then also just making sure that like, you're keeping it close to you and really just like going with your gut, I think as well. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I feel like it was so interesting because I am someone who I will take people's opinions, but then at the end of the day, I have the trump card in the sense of like, no, this is actually what I think is going to be best. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting too, in the book world, because you have so many different people with expertise in areas that you are not an expert in. And so I felt like in the publishing world, there is this level of having an incredible team at HarperCollins who they know books but then I know my audience. And so it's like, how do we mix the expertise? Same thing with you and I, like, you know, design and I know the book. Mm -hmm. And so it's like always this beautiful marriage. And I think a lot of times in entrepreneurship, the founder or the CEO or, you know, the person in charge, they can almost get like an ego and it's like, oh no, no, no. Like this needs to be so collaborative and like great for both parties. And you also need to lean on each other. That's why you're working together. And so I think it's a beautiful reminder too, for entrepreneurs who maybe are hesitant to hire help or who are struggling in accepting the right type of help. Like you want to bring people that know more than you do. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You want to accept their expertise because that's what makes like true magic. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a collaborative process. And especially with the book cover, because you're right, like we also had, you know, your publisher as well. And so we just want to make sure that like, you know, all people are happy and, you know, we're taking, you know, bits and pieces from everyone just because we want to make sure that like, it's really you know, what it's designed to be. And so, you know, like you said, like they know books best and Mm -hmm. we don't necessarily. So yeah, it was a really cool process. And that was something I was a little nervous about too, because I was like, I have worked for a publisher before and I had my old boss would like sit behind my desk and And like watch you design. She would, she would tell me to like move something over. She's like, move it over like 0.2 pikas. And I'm like, okay, why don't you just do it? So yeah. I, it's definitely like that balance of, Yes. Giving feedback and like having, you know, input, but then also not to the point where it's like total control because that's just not fun for anyone. Yes. You know, the phrase easy as pie, right? Well, anyone who's actually made a pie from scratch from the buttery flaky crust to the perfectly sweet filling knows that making pies is in fact very difficult, but you know, what is easy integrating, automating and scaling your business with HubSpot. The HubSpot CRM platform seamlessly transforms customer data into usable insights. Like what's the average time it takes to respond to a customer service request and how can we get better at it? The HubSpot service hub brings all your data and support channels into one place. So your team can spend less time hunting for information and more time delighting your customers. Plus, seamless connectivity with marketing and sales hubs means every person on your team has a crystal clear picture of your customer. It's easy as HubSpot. Learn how HubSpot can make it easier for your business to grow better at HubSpot.com. Hands down, one of the biggest game changers in my business was when I got super serious about automation strategies. If you can make your business run without you, why wouldn't you get that started ASAP? Zapier makes it easy to streamline those routine operations that eat up your time, like lead management, employee onboarding, or even customer support. You can connect all your apps, automate routine tasks, and streamline your processes, freeing up your time to prioritize customer and client needs, or just get more baby snuggles in like me. Zapier literally acts as the connector in my business, and it has for years, with using different softwares for things like email, shopping carts, courses, and opt-ins, we use Zaps to connect our bigger system and automate pieces of our process. Easily connect over 4,000 of the most popular apps businesses use every day, like Google Sheets, QuickBooks, and Facebook or Google Ads, to automate almost any workflow imaginable. And with thousands of easy-to-use templates, you can get started fast. See for yourself why teams at Airtable, Dropbox, HubSpot, Zendesk, and thousands of other companies use Zapier every day to automate their businesses. Try Zapier for free today at zapier.com slash gold digger. That's Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash gold digger. 
You know, what's crazy too, is a lot of my friends were shocked that I didn't have my face on the cover. And I was very clear from the very beginning that that was not something that I wanted ever. Isn't that wild? Yes. No. And actually that kind of surprised me a little bit too at first, because when you reached out to me, I was like, oh, I'm assuming you probably want a photo of you just because you built such a personal brand. And so it was just wild. I was like, well, this is more fun, honestly, because I like to be able to design, but Cause yeah, like photos obviously are great as well, but they can put a lot of limitation on, you know, what you can do with design. Well, and that's the thing too, is like the whole heart of the book is for people to find their truth. And so I'm like, if my face is on there, then it's just like how to be more like Jenna. And that's like the antithesis of the book. And so <laughs> yeah. it was like, but it, I had to advocate for not being on the cover. Cause that was just never anything that I wanted. And I'm so grateful that we went the route that we did for so many reasons, but it was just like, yeah, it was a really beautiful process. So how did designing a book cover and like kind of the branding around this whole project differ from other design projects? Cause you kind of hinted at it earlier. And I think this would be really good for anyone who has more of a niche business or they've kind of become known for one thing, but they are willing or excited to try something different. How was it different? And what would you advise for someone who is kind of just in one lane of work? Yeah, for sure. So it's crazy because I didn't realize it at the time, but there are so many similarities to, you know, branding and then also designing a book cover. And at first you would think like, oh, those are two totally different things, but not really because, you know, the book cover, as I kind of said before, like it is, you know, in a sense, like the logo of your brand. Right. And we also have to have all of these different assets that can go along with the promotion of the book. And so that was something that was really cool because, you know, in branding, like I'm a firm believer of not just designing like a logo and slapping it on everything, but rather really creating more of a memorable experience. And so that is done through typography and colors and textures and patterns and all of those things that really make up that feeling and that essence of the brand. And so the cool thing with your book was that it was kind of a similar process in the sense where like, yes, we had, you know, the, how are you really typeface, but then we also had, you know, textures and colors that we used and like even seeing you and your team, like use those across the promotion of the book. That was like super, super cool. And so it's also nice too, because you have to have those assets. Otherwise, like you're not going to be memorable, like even in promoting of the book. Whereas now, anytime I see that gold and that like peachy coral color combination with that, you know, sort of painted texture background, like I immediately think of your book. And so obviously I'm just the one who designed it, but I'm sure other people feel that way too, yeah. just because you are creating more of that like memorable feeling. So yeah, definitely a lot of similarities between the two. And I think just like really, you know, leaning into the design of it, but then also making sure that, you know, what you're creating allows it to live on beyond just like a book cover. So that was something that I thought was really cool about what we landed on was because we did have these textures and these elements and hand lettering and other like elements that we could incorporate across like all of your promotional materials as well. Yeah. You did such a good job to just setting us up for the ability to leverage the cover brand across everything. Talk to Mm -hmm. me a little bit, because one of the things that I think is incredible that you've done, and I think it reminded me a lot of my photography days in that, like how you deliver things changes how people enjoy them and leverage them. And when you delivered the brand guide for the cover, it literally said like, here are your fonts. Here's how you space them. Here is the color here. Like here's the hex things. And that allowed us to take what you initially created and hopefully do a really good job of matching that throughout all of the things that we've done. Walk me through that because I think a lot of times designers hand things over and then assume like, all right, now it's in your court. Let's see what (laughs) you do. And you might be disappointed in what happens next. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, as a designer, like, yes, it would be great if I could design every single promotional book material, but sometimes that's just not the reality. And it's the same thing with your business. Like you need to create something that is going to be able to be used by someone who does not have a design background. And so really spelling it out for them and walking them through that process And not only that too, like I am really big on just like overly explaining like why I design things the way that I design them. Like within each proof that we did, 
we would record videos back and forth. And I think that is just so helpful because it allows you to really understand like where my head's at. And then also on the flip side, I was able to really like understand your vision and like hearing your thoughts rather than just being like, Oh, here's the cover. Like, hope you like it, Mm -hmm. you know, more so like explaining, like I had to design it this way because of, you know, these limitations or how long this word is, or this won't fit in this type of space or whatnot. And so the same thing is when you are wrapping up the project, we want to make sure that, you know, we are really guiding our clients with as much information as possible so that like you can own what you have, you know, created and yeah, just like really make sure that is cohesive, you know, into the world and matches what the book feels like. And so I think you and your team did, like I said, an awesome job at doing that. And so I just want to like empower you as much as possible so that you are set up for success and not for failure. Yes. And you know, it's so funny, Brianna, is that after you did the cover, I was like, I want to change all of the Jenna Kutcher branding to match the cover. <laughs> I was on your site and I was like, I noticed she's using the gold. That yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and it was so funny too, because when we initially started with the book cover, we were going super neutral. And remember mm-hmm. where I was like, no, no, let's go for it. Like, let's go for color. It's okay. If it doesn't perfectly match the brand we have, we'll match the brand to the cover. Like this yes. is the pivot which has been so fun and exciting. And also just a reminder for people like your brand is supposed to evolve and transform Mm -hmm. and it's up to you to guide where it's going next. Like nothing is stuck. You're not locked in on any certain color or font, like things can change. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Walk me through if somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh my gosh, I have a logo from 2015 and I hate (laughs) it. Or, you know, I've been thinking about hiring a designer. Where would you begin and where should they start? Yeah. So I think so often, especially in more like established businesses, a lot of times people have a hard time breaking up with their logo because they're like, well, you know, I've had this for years, but it's like, but is it doing you like any good? Like, do you actually like it? Or do you just feel like you have to use it because, you know, it's what you created, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. So I think being open and just like transparent about all of that, because we'll have people come to us and they'll be like, well, I want you to design my brand and my website, but like, I just, I have to use this logo. And it's like, but why? Like always ask yourself why, like, is there a reason behind that? And then the other thing is, is that when you are forcing old elements, you know, from the past, like an old logo, you are then essentially designing your entire brand around that logo in order to make it work. And so it really puts you in a box. And so I just always encourage clients to like go into it with an open mind by all means. Like I love looking at, you know, old brands and seeing how we can improve it from there. But like when we're forced to use existing elements, it can just be so tricky. And I think you know, sometimes, you know, with your brand, it's a bit different because, you know, you're primarily online, but for brands that have products or, you know, a storefront or things like that, they're like, well, I spent, you know, $10,000 on this logo on the sign. Like I can't change it. And it's like, but you don't have to do it overnight. And I think so often people get nervous feeling like, oh, well, if I change my branding, like it has to be, you know, a light switch that I turn on and off. And it's like, no, you can slowly, gradually change it over time and roll it out. And there's ways you can go about that and you can prioritize like what's the most important thing for you to roll out. Like, you know, with products that, you know, have a logo on them, I'm always like, use all of them. Like, don't just like get rid of your products because it has your old logo on it. You know, your customers aren't going to really care or probably notice like fully. So like, it's okay for you to slowly roll that out over time and not feel like, you know, to me, it's like, it's so sad to like be stuck with something that you're not like super happy with just because you have, you know, elements with that logo or that design on it. And so just being really open and thinking about, you know, what you envision for yourself in the next, you know, three to five years. And is your current branding and site like really setting you up for success? Like I loved with you, like I've even noticed you are just like so much more into color and you have been such a neutral girl for so long. And that was a really fun thing to be a part of because I'm like, yes, like we can just kind of go wild with this and have fun and not feel like we are, you know, stuck in a neutral box. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And that evolution, I think is something that should be exciting to us. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be daunting. It shouldn't be scary. And I can't tell you how many people I meet where they're like, Oh, don't look at my old business card or don't look at my (laughs) website or don't go, you know, like, And it's like, if you are feeling that uncomfortable in your home on the internet, then Mm -hmm. it's a good signal that it's time to change and invite something new and fresh in. And I think that's exciting. 
Yes. It's supposed to be fun. And that's the thing too. I think so often like people will be so nervous about doing it, but then they yeah. do it. They're like, why didn't I do this years ago? They're oh my like, gosh. This is so much better than what I ever had. I feel so much more confident because that's the thing. Like you can't confidently put yourself out there if you like hate the way it looks. Right. Yes. And yes. so that was the same thing with you. You're like, I can't put this cover out here if I don't love it. And yes. so we want to make sure that you are feeling empowered behind the design and you feel confident in it. And if you don't love it, you're sure as heck, like not going to want to promote it. Amen. Oh my gosh. Okay. Final question. What advice would you give to a designer wanting to land their dream clients? I feel like you have done a really good job of finding people that love your work and appreciate your work. Hopefully that's true, yes. but also sticking to a very like certain aesthetic and style. And so you attract in the right people and get to do the work you love. What advice would you give someone that's maybe not there quite yet? Yeah. So I think in the early years of design, it's definitely like trying to figure out what your style is and all of that. And so I just encourage designers to create, 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 because you don't know what your style is until you explore. And it doesn't happen from, you know, searching what other people are doing on the internet. It happens from within. And as woo woo as that sounds, it's so true. So I think the more you are truly like living in alignment with yourself, the more your style is just going to like confidently, you know, become its own thing. And so definitely practice definitely, you know, just explore projects for fun. Even if you don't have any clients, like come up with one and design for it. It doesn't have to be real. A lot of times I'll even still do that just for like fun, you know, creative ways to just like express myself. And so definitely, you know, taking all of those, you know, fictitious brands that you create and promoting them on social media and sharing about the design process, you know, not just throwing up, a cool logo and be like, Hey, what do you think of this? But rather like walk people through like what that process looks like. I think people are so mesmerized by everyone's process. And so the more you can like let people in on the behind the scenes, the more they're going to really like connect with you and your work. And yeah, just like showing up and being yourself, you know, I've definitely tried to build much more of a personal brand where people really feel like they can know me and connect with me and all of that. And so I think that just really helps build a lot more trust into the design process because you know, they're not going to connect with my logos necessarily, but they are going to connect with me because I'm a human. So making sure that, you know, you're showing up in that sort of way. And then, you know, just going ham on Pinterest and Instagram, like the places people go for design inspiration is Pinterest. And I feel like so many people are not using that platform to their full potential. So definitely going crazy on that and just promoting it and sharing it and, you know, getting the word out about it. And of course, like your work at first might you know, might suck, might not be great, but it takes time and it will get better and better and better. And, you know, much like our book process, like the design just kept getting better and better. And so doing that and like not beating yourself up over it, but really just like leaning into what excites you and what fuels you creatively. Oh, where can everybody find you and connect with you and see more of your beautiful creations? Give us all the places. Yes. So you can find me at Brighton Made, and then I'm on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, all the things. And then I also have a small product shop, which is an extension of Brighton Made. So essentially like my design work on, you know, lifestyle goods. And that is at Brighton Living. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for all that you've done for me and for my book. And I have just loved working with you. I know this is not a one and done. I know we're going to be connected for a very long time. And so I just want you to know every time I see this book, I think of you and I'm just so grateful for the part that you played in helping me get it out into the world. Yes. No, it was amazing and a dream come true. So thank you, Jenna. Honestly, it's still unreal for me to see my book, like to hold it in my hands, to flip it over and look at the back cover. And I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to work with Brianna to design something that feels like me, that helps communicate the message that's beautiful to serve as a reminder on your bookshelf or your nightstand so that you remember to keep on checking in on yourself and asking that question that we all like to avoid. How are you? really. And I have just loved bringing people into the fold throughout my entire book journey from my videographer to my photographer, to the creative people, to the designers, the writers, it takes an entire team to get a book out into the world. And I'm just so grateful that Brianna was a part of mine. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the gold digger podcast. And of course, until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. 
I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 